Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Al. Once again, more people here now. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all those that were not here this morning. When your day comes tomorrow, we want you to have a very good day and just continue to thank the Lord for all his goodness and mercy. And us, you know, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, I always like to sing this little song before I start. Turn your eyes up on Jesus. Gets me in the mood to uh, say a word to you. If you'll sing with me, please. Turn your eyes up on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us pray, Father God. Once again, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy towards us. You're such a loving God. And Father, this morning as we come to worship and to praise your name, we ask that your presence will be here with us, that everything that happens here today, Lord, will be pleasing to you, to bring honor and glory. And somebody will leave here, Lord, feeling it was good for us to have been in the house of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we look at the world today, what do we see? We see hate, greed, killings, wars. When we turn on the news, there is hardly any good news. And it doesn't seem like there is a lot of love in the world, although there is love. But it doesn't seem that way at times. We become so accustomed to hearing bad news that it becomes just a way of life. But is this what God intended from the beginning? Now, if we turn back to our scripture reading, I got this thing here that I'm going to try with here this morning, see what happens. All right. Turn to our scripture readings um, in um, Matthew 7 and verse 12. The Bible says, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye, ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophet. Th I think it is called the golden rule. When God created this world, he wanted a replica of heaven. He wanted a replica of heaven on earth. He wanted a people to live in harmony with his will. But sin entered and everything began a downward spir spiral. But God had a plan to preserve us for, to preserve us from destruction. And the plan is still in effect. But in order for this plan to work, we have to get involved. People need to get involved. This involvement is called the golden rule. Love one another. Anyone who does not practice the golden rule will not have admission to heaven. Matthew 13. Matthew 7 and verse 13. It says, enter ye at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to what? Destruction. And many there be which go in thereof. Jesus invite those who will be his followers to come. But know what you are getting involved, getting involved in. The straight gate. 
This is not an ordinary gate. Straight, confined, exacting, difficult, narrow passage. Room for one person at a time. Those who tell you that there are many roads to heaven, all road leads to heaven, that is not what the Bible says. There are those that say, live any way you want to. God is too loving to keep you out of heaven. But the broad road leads to what? Destruction. In verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which lead it unto life, and few there be that find it. The first the text said, many there be that find the what? The broad road, but few there be that find the narrow road. Only those that strive for eternal life will receive it. And it's only one road. That road leads to Jesus Christ. In Matthew 18 and verse 20, the Bible says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am, in the midst of them. The amazing thing about it. The amazing, the, the amazing thing about it. Jesus would sooner have two or three faithful people than a whole church full of hypocrites. I have a little story here that I'd like to read you this morning. It says, tall, muscular youth named Chuck showed up one day at the home of Pat, a fellow member of a small gang called the Rubies. Pat was alone, and Chuck asked quickly, You ready? Ready for what? To rob the bakery at Fred Fort and Elm, Chuck replied, grinning. Weeks before, the two had planned to knock off the joint as soon as Pat could get around on his bad leg. He'd been shot while robbing a house. Hesitantly, Pat began to explain, Chuck, a few days ago, something happened to me. What happened? I got saved. Saved from what? I accepted Christ as my Savior, but blurted out his story about church, an altar call, confession and forgiveness, a new peace as God's child. Okay, so now you're saved. Big deal. Come on. Let's go rob the bakery. So you're saved. So you're saved. Big deal. Chuck's response is all too true for too many people. What difference does conversion make? Conversion? Big deal. Claiming to be born again has very little to do with genuine conversion. A genuine commitment to Christ leads to an authentic Christianity. That makes a radical difference. All habits are changed. All attitudes are transformed. All thought patterns are renewed. By faith, we accept that the old person was nailed to the cross with Christ. The old person died. By faith, we believe that when Christ was resurrected, we too was made alive in him. We now live new lives through sin, through the power of the resurrected Christ. But now, 
having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Genuine conversion does make a difference. If there is no difference, there is no conversion. I don't think there was any robbery that day, at least not with Pat. In Hebrews 10, in Hebrews 10 and verse 12, we read, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Recognizing the old covenant of sacrificing of animals, and now the new covenant with Christ as our sacrifice. In verse 6, 13, it says, From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, do we know, understand what that means? Christ's enemies put him to death. And they thought that was the end of it all. But now, they can't hurt Jesus anymore. One day, they'll be made his footstool. They're going to be kneeling one day to the King and King, Lord of Lords. In verse 14, it says, Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the con a a covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Those who choose Christ's sacrifice, those who choose Christ's sacrifice, perfected, that means complete, and sanctified, that means setting apart for holy use, for holy work. We don't have any more to worry about. Christ has done that for us. When he went to the cross, he took away all our sins. He took them all to the cross with him and died for our sins. So we don't have to die anymore to sin. In verse 15, having therefore, brethren, boldness, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he had consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh and having an high priest over the house of God. And verse 17, let us draw near with, no, Hold on there for a second. Let me, let me go back and get this Bible here so I I'm make sure I'm in the right, right place. Okay. Hebrews, I'm in Hebrews 18, right? Huh? Hebrews 10, beg your pardon, Hebrews 10, yes, beg your pardon. Hebrews 10, and I'm now in verse uh, 18, 
and their sins and iniquity. Um, the days of, beg your pardon. And their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. Now where uh, remission of sin is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, verse 19, boldness to enter into the holiest of the, of the, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, I think I'm okay here. And now we go to verse 20. And having a high priest, Okay, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter, okay, by a new living way, which is, I, I always get problem with this thing here. Okay, let us draw near with a true heart in, and that's verse 21, have an eye priest over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and our bodies Wash with pure water, sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies wash with pure water. Amen. Let us draw near. Let us draw. Let us draw. Uh, let us hold fast. Let me. The one after that? Okay. And there are sins, iniquity. Oh, man. Let us draw near. Oh, there you go. Let us draw near with a true heart in full. Draw near. Okay. All right. Oh, let us. Okay. <laughs> Without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another to what? To provoke unto love and good works. Now, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Amen. Now, here is what I want to say to you today. When we come to Christ accepting his sacrifice, all our previous sins are blotted out. Don't have to keep asking forgiveness for that sin anymore unless we continue in it. Then it becomes presumptuous. I heard a preacher the other day. I was coming from the course, the golf course, and I uh, heard this preacher on the radio, and he was talking. And he told the people, he says, that God... Died for all your sins. Past sins, present sins, and future sins. And I said, that doesn't sound very true. That can't be right. Because remember the lady, when they brought Mary to Jesus, caught in adultery, and she was there, and when Jesus was talking, and when the Talk to the other folks, and when they all left, Jesus turned to her and said, Woman, where are your accusers? She said, Well, Lord, I don't see it, any of them. Jesus said, Well, guess what? There's nobody to condemn you. I don't condemn you either. Go your way and continue to sin. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Go your way. And sin no more. Amen. If we continue in sin, we're going to have a problem. Because we have a God who died for us. And he has the ability to keep us from sinning. He has the ability to keep us from sinning. And we can go to him... Boldly. 
We don't have to go through anybody else to get to Jesus. We don't have to go to any earthly man. We don't have to go to any priest. Or we don't have to go to any pastor. We don't have to go to anybody to go directly to the throne of grace. Boldly. Because God had made that provision for us. And then he comes back and he said, And let us consider one another. One another. To provoke unto love and to good works. You know, that word provoke means, you know, it, the Bible says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. That is not a good thing. Provoke is irritate to anger. But there's another meaning. Or stirring up to action. We can encourage each other to do good things. Encourage each other to stay with the Lord. Encourage each other to do the work that the Lord has left for us to do. Amen. And that's the provoke that we need for each other. Verse 19. 10 verse, not the 25. I want to go get to something else before. I went through all that. To say this, there, is a, there are some people in Africa, read this story, in one region of Africa, the first converts to Christianity were very diligent about praying. In fact, the believers each had their own special place outside the village where they went to pray in solitude. The villagers reached these uh, prayer rooms by using their own private footpaths through the bush. When grass began to grow over one of these trails, it was evident that the person to whom it belonged was not praying very much. Because of these, because these new Christians were concerned for each other's spiritual welfare, a unique custom sprang up. Whenever anyone noticed an overgrown prayer path, he or she would go to the person, and don't forget, don't miss this word, and lovingly warn, friend, there is grass on your path. You see, you and I we go to church, we are brothers and sisters in the church. And if we see somebody going the wrong way, that we believe they're going the wrong way. Sometimes we're not right about what we think we see. But if you see somebody that you think is going the wrong way, you have to approach them. How? Lovingly. You get out there lovingly. People can handle loving talk or counsel when you go to them and tell them that you think or you would like to help them to get back on the right path. God is so wonderful, so loving and kind to us that we don't have to worry about anything because we have each other to encourage each other we have, you and I can encourage, I can encourage you, you can encourage me to stay on the path. Amen. One verse I wanted to get to. I went through a lot of that. And, you know, listen, I messed up here. This, this, this thing is getting to me, this, uh, this little button here. I'm going to start going back to my Bible and just preach from my Bible. It throws me off ground. But I said, I want to get to this verse here. This is the one here. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaken the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. My brothers and sisters, what do we see approaching? 
What is the day that we see approaching? Huh? We see approaching what? The coming of the Lord. The nearness. The times in which we are living. We believe Jesus coming is not far off. The things of the world, the things that are happening in the world now is telling us that Jesus is getting ready to come back. He's getting ready to come back for his church, his bride, for us. And therefore, we have to do everything we can to stay the course, to stay the course. Encourage each other. Love each other. Working together for the finishing of the work so that Jesus can come and take us home. We see all kinds of signs happening. And now the government is making noise. And we have to start looking and watching and listening to the things that are happening. Because we have a work to do, still have a work to do. And we need to finish that work before Jesus comes. And so, my brothers, children of God must live together so that the world can see us. And you know what? It can be very, we can be very attractive to the people to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Attract them not to us, but to Jesus. That's what our attraction should be. We should be ready and able to tell them about the love of Jesus and the soon coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters, let us hang on. Let us be faithful to the work that the Lord has left for us to do because very soon, soon and very soon, he will come back to take us home. We look forward to that day when he'll come in the clouds of heaven, and take us to live with him forever. God bless you all.